Well, hello and welcome to This Week in Pennsylvania. I'm Dennis Owens. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you and yours. And 2023 is just about in the books. But before we turn the page to what promises to be an exciting 2024, we thought we'd look back at the eventful year that just was. For the next half hour, we'll look back at the most important stories of the year and show them as they aired. We begin, of course, in January and the swearing in of a new governor. Josh Shapiro took over for Tom Wolf and became the state's 48th chief executive. The older generation was there. Former Republican governors Tom Ridge, Mark Schweiker and Tom Corbett and soon to be former governor Tom Wolf. But then youth was served. The torch passed. Please welcome to the stage. Pennsylvania's 48th governor and first lady. And our parents, Josh and Lori Shapiro. The first kids got to announce dad, 49-year-old Josh Shapiro, and mom, Lori. And the young first couple swept onto the stage. They even had fun with the swearing in. So help me God. Congratulations. Shapiro thanked his family and praised his predecessor. And thanks to his leadership, we now find ourselves in the strongest financial shape in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, allowing us to make the critical investments of tomorrow. Shapiro promised to fight for all Pennsylvanians, especially those on the margins. Your struggles give me purpose. Your smiles and your tears, they have filled my heart. Your problems have become my priorities. Your cause is my concern. Shapiro praised the courage of Pennsylvania voters. We didn't allow the extremists who peddle lies to drown out the truth. We showed that our system works. Our elections are free and fair, safe and secure. Shapiro vowed to do the necessary hard work ahead, presumably with the legislature. He's got a state house of representatives that can't even do roll call. It's not functioning. He has a Republican controlled state Senate, but every day is a new challenge for the head of the state, right? So as I'm sure Governor Wolf is telling him right now, if he hasn't already. <laughs> that he's not Governor Wolf? is A-OK -okay with the Senate's GOP boss. Well, my impression of former Governor Wolf was that he was simply intractable. Uh, he did not have any sense of how to work with the legislature to reach common ground. And that's where I'm most optimistic that our new governor may have that sense. Optimism and goodwill, that's day one currency that each of Shapiro's 47 predecessors enjoyed on Inauguration Day. How long it lasts? Well, that's the big question. With my heart open to others and my eyes fixed ahead, I am prepared now to do my part to move our Commonwealth forward. And all living governors except Ed Rendell, who's been battling health issues, attended that swearing in. That same month, John Fetterman was sworn in as U.S. Senator. He faced several health that issues in his first year. First, he was hospitalized after feeling lightheaded in February. Fetterman had a stroke during his campaign last year, but his office says the tests ruled out a new stroke. That same month, he was hospitalized again, this time for clinical depression. While receiving treatment for several weeks, his team said he worked from Walter Reed Hospital. Fetterman's fellow Democrat, Senator Bob Casey, also had a health scare. Casey was diagnosed with prostate cancer in February, underwent surgery. Doctors say it went well. Casey is not expected to need further treatment. He is on the campaign trail seeking re-election. Also in February, a Norfolk Southern train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, just yards from the Pennsylvania border. The train was carrying toxic chemicals, triggering evacuations and reports of illness possibly linked to poor air and water quality. Pennsylvania State Department of Environmental Protection said its soil and water tests on our side of the derailment have not detected any contamination. However, it prompted fines and hearings by both state and federal lawmakers and calls for tighter restrictions on the rail industry. Well, the Pennsylvania State House had a derailment of its own. Democrats won a single seat majority in the election, but because of a death and two representatives that won other seats, they were actually in the minority until special elections could be held. Unable to settle on a speaker, they embarked on a grand experiment that was hailed nationwide for overcoming partisan politics. A Republican nom nominated Democrat Mark Rousey, who declared himself an independent speaker. But a week later, no one was happy and there were calls for Rousey to step down. It feels really bad. It hurts. What a difference a week makes. Republican Jim Gregory. We need a speaker. 
like Representative Rossi. Nominated Democrat Mark Rossi to be Speaker of the House. With fidelity. Congratulations, Mr. Speaker. And gushed about the historic arrangement moments after the vote. Mark is no longer a Democrat, as you heard during his speech. He is uh, now an independent. I trust him. I believe in him. But Gregory says the trust is broken. I said, so you're going to go independent? He said yes. Gregory says Rossi twice told him point blank he'd become an independent, but the Democrat is now reluctant. And it's not okay that you are not going to tell the truth just because it's politics. That's a lot of our problem in this country that we, we accept and allow untruthfulness and lying because it's politics. It's part of the game. No. Gregory says Rossi should resign. And I don't know how you, you go forward with either caucus because both caucuses now have to look at him and wonder, how can we work with him? Speaker Rossi is not speaking at the moment and the caucus is not working. Well, we are uh, just in a mess. We, we don't have our rules. And apparently there's little direction, but lots of frustration in the ranks. You know, if, if we can't get anything accomplished, if you're not um, going to make it work, then it's time to find somebody who can get it done. While there's always backbiting at the Capitol to Gregory, it seems more personal than political. I thought I knew who he was, and now I don't. And Rossi insisted that it was Republicans who broke a deal to run a clean amendment to help survivors of child sex abuse. He did go on a several week listening tour across the Commonwealth, but his reign was marked by inaction and frustration, and it lasted less than two months. In March, another special election was needed after Democrat Representative Mike Zabel resigned amid allegations of sexual harassment. A lobbyist alleged the Delaware County lawmaker groped her, and then sitting Republican Representative Abby Major publicly accused Zabel of sexually harassing her at a Harrisburg bar. From men struggling to women making history, Philadelphia Democrat Joanna McClinton made her history as she succeeded Rossi as Speaker of the House. This was widely expected once Democrats secured their majority in the House through special elections. McClinton is the first woman to be elected PA House Speaker and second African-American, joining Leroy Irvis. State Senator Kim Ward also made history. The Republican from Westmoreland County is the first female president pro tem of the Senate in Pennsylvania history. So the two most powerful legislators are women for the first time ever. And just across the street, Pennsylvania Supreme Court Deborah Todd, Justice Deborah Todd, became the high court's first female chief justice. Todd had been serving in the role since Chief Justice Max Baer's death in late September of 22, when she officially was sworn in this year. Lots of glass ceilings shattered in Harrisburg within weeks of each other. But there is still work to do. Pennsylvania has never elected a woman governor or U.S. senator. Stay with us as we continue to recap an eventful 2023 in state politics. Welcome back as we look back at 2023 and the notable stories and people that shaped the year. In April, freshman Senator John Fetterman went back to work after battling depression and his prior stroke. But it was not a timid return to D.C. He's made several waves, not only in the Democratic Party, but the whole Capitol. First, the dress code was briefly relaxed for what many assumed was an accommodation for Fetterman, who likes to wear shorts and hoodies. You see him there. He also called out his own party for not insisting that Senator Bob Menendez stepped down after being charged with bribery and allegedly found with gold bars in his house. Later in the year, Fetterman again was trending for saying he was not a progressive for supporting Israel and calling for a crackdown at the U.S. southern border. In May, Governor Shapiro signed a law that requires insurers to cover preventative breast and ovarian cancer screenings for high-risk women at no cost to them. Insurers will pay for those scans. The bill passed the House and Senate unanimously. Thanks in large part to the bipartisan cooperation of the legislature's top leaders, both women. Yeah. House Speaker Joanna McClinton, the Democrat, Republican Senate President Pro Tem Kim Ward, who is herself a breast cancer survivor. I'm proud to sign the first bill of my administration after it unanimously passed through her chamber and her chamber. Yeah. Pennsylvania leaders stand with the good people of Pennsylvania, and we take care of our people. Supporters say not only will this law save lives in Pennsylvania, it will help at-risk women save a lot of money, especially those previously unable to afford those tests. While control of the state house was up for grabs again in May in Delaware County, special election to replace Mike Zabel, 
Governor Shapiro was criticized for saying in an ad that abortion rights would be threatened if Democrat Heather Boyd lost, even though her Republican opponent, Katie Ford, made clear in a debate that we hosted that she is pro-choice. Didn't matter. The 163rd the district leans period. Democrat. There's, there's Polls no suggested it would be close. It was not. Boyd easily defeated that. Ford, um, getting I more than 62 percent of the position. vote. June is typically budget season, but there was nothing typical about this year's process. Experts say that's not unusual when there are so many new faces at the budget table and a new dynamic with Democrats in control of the House. There were fits and starts to be sure, even though there is unprecedented cash in the Commonwealth coffers. There was also a major fight over school vouchers that caused broken down talks and a break in trust. But a highway off ramp was a bridge for state leaders to come together and pull off an amazing feat. A tanker truck crashed, burned, and collapsed the heavily traveled I-95 in Northeast Philadelphia, snarling more than 100,000 vehicles a day. State and federal agencies worked together to cut red tape and find resources. That highway reopened just a dozen days later. We all came together and we showed that when times get hard, Pennsylvanians show up for one another. It's safely completed and it's ready for traffic. And I don't think the people of Philadelphia want to wait one more minute. I-95 has temporary lanes as work continues on that permanent fix. The state transportation officials last update. It is ahead of schedule, should wrap up next year. Stay with us. Much more This Week in Pennsylvania when we come right back. And welcome back as we take you through the top stories of 2023 in chronological order and as they happened. By August, the state budget standoff was mostly over. Governor Shapiro signed it. Blue Line vetoed the $100 million for school vouchers that House Democrats opposed. Senate Republicans previously blasted Governor Shapiro for reneging on a deal to fund those vouchers, but by August, leaders were more conciliatory, saying they hoped for fruitful future negotiations. So he is the governor for the next three and a half years. We respect that. We understand that. We're eager to hit a reset button and work with him going forward to improve this entire commonwealth. What a significant step to ensure that Pennsylvanians begin to receive uh, uh, the budget allocation that they're, they're asking us for. School districts, community violence programs, uh, pre, pre-K programs, school programs and the like. All these type of programs have been waiting and we're fearful that this would be a situation where we wouldn't be able to get these resources out. A lot of them had visions of 2015-2016 budget impasse in their minds and I'm glad today we'll be able to put some, that to rest. But about a billion dollars in contested items like teacher stipends and whole home repairs were left unfunded at that time, with lawmakers still needing to pass code bills that direct exactly how money should be spent. Those budgetary tidbits would linger until December. There may be no such thing as a free lunch, but lawmakers and the governor trumpeted free universal breakfast for all public school students in PA. They added $46 million to a program offering universal free breakfast for about 1.7 million students. The budget also provides money for free lunches to students who qualify through the national school lunch program. A win for kids and a win for seniors. The new budget expanded the property tax and rent rebate program. Governor prioritized this during his campaign. Nearly 175,000 more people will qualify and 400,000 seniors who had already qualified will see their rebates nearly double. But there were legislative fails in 2023, notably an attempt to move the 2024 primary election date. It is scheduled for April 23rd. That's the first day of Passover. The House, the Senate governor all concede that's a bad day and there were several bills to change it. One of them to March, one to earlier in April, but bizarrely, legislative gridlock gripped the Capitol around this issue and nothing actually passed. Counties na now say it's too late for them to react and the legislature shouldn't move it from April 23rd since poll workers and locations have been set and scheduled. And in 2024, there will be also be another election for a Pennsylvania U.S. Senate seat. Republican Dave McCormick taking another shot at it. He lost to Mehmet Oz by less than 1,000 votes in the GOP primary last year. Oz then lost to John Fetterman, while McCormick seems to have clear sailing to the general election against Democrat Bob Casey, who is seeking a fourth term. Registering to vote has never been easier in Pennsylvania. This fall, Pennsylvania started automatically registering people at PennDOT offices when they renewed their driver's licenses, unless they opt out. The governor ordered the move, and he insists it's making a difference. Early indications are the data seems to suggest more and more people are registering to vote. My view on this, and I've said this many times, is 
I don't care how you register to vote. I don't care what your political viewpoint is. I just think our democracy is strengthened when more people participate. And in the first few months after that announcement, state says 58,000 voters updated their registration or registered for the first time at PennDOT. From making it easier to vote, Governor Shapiro tried to make it a little easier to become a state trooper by eliminating the college degree requirement. Since that announcement, state police have seen a spike in applications. PSP says the average number of eligible applicants per month increased a whopping 240 percent. In this year's budget, the state is funding 400 additional troopers, and they need to recruit enough people to swell those ranks. Well, Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis and Pennsylvania Second Lady Blair Holmes Davis added to their family this year. They welcomed a baby girl, Harper. This is the couple's first child. Congratulations to them. Don't go anywhere. More this week in Pennsylvania after the break. And welcome back to our journey through 2023. One of the big stories of the fall involved a top aide to Governor Shapiro who resigned after being accused of sexually harassing a former state employee. It later came out the state made a settlement over the allegations. The accuser was paid $196,000 while her two lawyers each pocketed 50 grand paid for by the state and its self-insurance program. The incident prompted calls for new rules and laws to protect women in the workplace and make more transparent for taxpayers where exactly money is going in such cases. Myself and a few other House members are looking into ways that we can fix the system, changes that we can make to, one, make the process more transparent and to protect women who work here in the Capitol from men like this, from, from men who act this way. Certainly if others have ideas on how that can be strengthened across the board for the legislature and the executive branch, uh, I'll certainly be willing to take a careful look at that. Several Republican women in the House followed through on that, unveiling a legislative package it says would make significant reforms to protect those victims and taxpayers. And as you just heard, the governor says he is open to those ideas. In November, a much anticipated court ruling halted an environmental regulation imposed by former Governor Tom Wolf. Wolf put Pennsylvania into the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, which required power plant owners to pay for their emissions. But Commonwealth Court ruled that amounted to a tax which only the legislature can impose. A few weeks later, Governor Shapiro appealed that ruling to the state Supreme Court, but argued that in the meantime, he wants to work with lawmakers to come up with an alternate plan. It's a tough issue for Shapiro because the business community says the carbon tax will hinder one of the state's top industries, while environmentalists say fossil fuels endanger air, water, and public health. Election night was ladies' night in Pennsylvania, where women won big on both sides of the Commonwealth. Democrat Sherelle Parker defeated Republican David O to become the 100th mayor of Philadelphia and the first woman to hold that office. Parker replaces Jim Kenney, who served the maximum two terms. terms. Philadelphians haven't elected a Republican mayor since the 1950s. Jumping to the other side of PA, progressive Democrat Sarah Inamorato becomes the first woman elected Allegheny County executive. She defeated Republican Joseph Rocky. And Amarato is a former state representative. The county executive is often called Pennsylvania's most powerful office west of Harrisburg. Her victory is considered a huge win also for the progressive movement. While abortion rights were not officially on the ballot in PA, it's pretty clear the right to choose motivated so many voters to choose Democratic candidates. There were four statewide judicial seats up for grabs, and all four of those seats were claimed by Democrats. Well, it was a rough end of the year for the University of Pennsylvania's president. Uh, she was uh, removed from office, stepped down. President Elizabeth McGill resigned after intense backlash over her comments during a congressional hearing, where critics say she didn't forcefully enough condemn anti-Semitism as a violation of campus policy, calling a, quote, a context-based decision and defending, on, and defending free speech. Governor Shapiro called her comments shameful. McGill issued an apology the day after her testimony, but it was not enough to save her job. Twas just weeks before Christmas and all through the House and Senate, lots of lawmakers were stirring, some like to grouse. Late into the evening and six months late, the final codes bills to put the 2023-24 budget to bed were finally passed. Visions of community college funding, child tax care credits, and 911 funding and other goodies danced in lawmakers' heads, allowing them to finally proclaim finished budget to all and to all a good night.
the best news is, in addition to finishing the budget, we got some great bipartisan legislative wins okay. last the year. The most extreme dysfunction I've ever seen in this state capitol, and I'm entering my 20th year of service. It just goes to show you what we can do when we come together to get done for the good people of Pennsylvania. Governor Shapiro's next budget address is in February. The state house is not returning until March. Neither is the state senate for that matter. Well, that's a wrap for 2023, and we wonder what stuff, as the governor likes to say, will get done in 2024. We are the biggest of the battleground states. We have an election for president, U.S. Senate, all of Congress, all the statewide row offices, all the state house, and half of the state Senate. Wow, lots of elections. We hope to bring you a few debates of the biggest races along the way. And lots of policy questions need to be answered this year. How will lawmakers resolve public school funding, which a state court called unconstitutionally inequitable? Will natural gas producers face that carbon tax? How will the Supreme Court rule on that? What about that long languishing constitutional amendment to let survivors of childhood sexual abuse sue their abusers? Right now there's different versions in the House and Senate. They gotta get those to match. There's lots for us to watch and hopefully that will keep you watching this week in Pennsylvania. We certainly wanna thank you for your viewership and wish you a happy, healthy and prosperous new, new year. And remember, if you miss any parts of this week in Pennsylvania, when it airs all across the Commonwealth, you can always catch episodes on thisweekinpennsylvania.com and another hello to Pittsburgh. We are now once again on in uh, the western part of the state in the biggest market in the West. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for watching. We sure hope to see you next week in the new year on this week.